I'm recording now. So anyway, okay. So to summarize what I missed on the recording, uh, system one and system two on page 56, learn that. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so there you go. Um, <laughs> Now the the other the other fundamental concept that is introduced in in this uh, in this in, at the beginning of the chapter is that of priming. Priming, um, priming is it's 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 easy to understand, but it's hard to describe. Um, priming is basically giving you a hint of something that forces you to think of something else, right? So um, you know, for example. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm doing a word association test with you, right, or or asking you to look at a pu you know, at a random uh, uh, square of letters and and to find the word in there, if I subconsciously prime you with the word bread, uh, and the word butter is in that puzzle, you'll find the word butter quicker than you would have otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> because you were primed, you were primed with the, uh, the, the word bread. Uh, and when you were primed with that word, it activated, it activated other related thoughts that are associated with bread, like, like butter. Um, priming, you know, priming is one of those fundamental things that underlies a lot of these uh, um, uh, biases and effects that we're going to talk about, right? Priming is something that underlies uh, uh, all sorts of like things like racism and, and, and lots of other things. It's a very fundamental part of, uh, of how we process our social world. Um, you know, we, I, we can prime you with all kinds of things. I can prime you with things to, um, you know, to get, to get you to think a certain way to, or to think of certain things more than others. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, one of the things that salespeople do, salespeople are like, you know, they know these things, right? If you've got a salesperson that's trying to sell, that, that's trying to sell you a car, right? Um, you know, they're going to be very slowly priming you. <laughs> You know, uh, you know, you're going to be putting up resistance like, well, you know, I don't know if I can afford it. And, and, uh, and, you know, and they'll be talking about how nice the car, while you're talking about if you, how you can't afford it, they'll be talking about how nice the car is, right? You know, how, and then when you start talking about how nice the car is, they'll switch and start talking about, oh, we have some easy payment plans. And then when you, once you start, once you stop talking about how nice the car is and start talking about the quality of the car, they'll go back to talking about maybe how nice the car is, how pretty it is. And then once you start talking about the quality of the car, they'll go back to priming you about the, the, <laughs> the, you know, the easy payment plan. So they're always working all the different angles, priming you, you know, putting in your brain that, let's see, you know, he's going to, he's going to fight me on price. He's going to fight me on quality. He's going to fight me on the color of the car, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to like prime him in different ways. Right. That's what they do. Um, one of the, uh, you know, one of the really scary things about um, priming is that uh, people with depression, you know, depressed moods um, can prime negative thoughts and negative associations. Right. Uh, those of you, uh, you know, the statistics say that, you know, maybe two or three of you in this little square images I'm looking at right now uh, has dealt with depression. Um, you know, maybe more of you, I don't know, but I have, I, I, I still do. Um, but, um, you know, if it, one of the things about depression is that the way I describe it, it's like a spiral. <laughs> you just like, you know, you get worse and worse and worse. So you just spiral in, right? And you're just like, you know, just swirling into these negative thoughts. And one of the reasons those thoughts are so negative is because of priming, right? You know, you, you, you have a depressed mood, that depressed mood primes negative thoughts. And then those negative thoughts prime other negative thoughts. And then those other, ne you know, so you, you end up with this chain of effects, right? That, you know, ultimately ends in suicide, unfortunately. Um, one of the, uh, <laughs> some, uh, sometimes um, uh, when uh, medical students are learning about new, new diseases, sometimes they'll start thinking they have the diseases. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, 
uh, which which I think is hilarious, <laughs> but, but apparently they don't. Um, yeah, you know, once you start talking, thinking about you know rashes and you know eye worms and things and shit like you know scary shit like that, you know, they'll they'll start thinking, oh, I, you know, I've got like worms in my eyes, and uh, yeah, I remember one one uh, friend of mine who was in medical school. Uh, she kind of freaked out when she learned about tapeworms in the brain. She was like, Oh my God. <laughs> she just started getting really obsessed with like making sure that the meat that she ate was like, you know, charbroiled <laughs> into like a hockey puck, you know, just to make sure she could have killed everything. Um, so going from that, so the fundamentals, right? We've got this intuitive system, we've got this deliberative system, and then we've got this fundamental thing of priming where we can sort of jack some thoughts based on what we experience with. The first, uh, the first trip uh, through our little story here after learning about those fundamentals is uh, another bit of fundamentals called intuitive judgments. Um, you know, again, we have these intuitive judgments that we make based on automatic sorts of thoughts. Um, we use our schemas. If you remember, schemas are these mental models of the world that we have. Um, and a lot of times we will experience, um, well, one of the really neat things about schemas is they very much affect how we understand and interpret the world. Schemas affect the way we understand and interpret the world. Um, a really simple example that's given in your book is, you know, I can talk about religious, uh, you know, I can talk about the different types of uh, religious um, sects that exist, you know, right, the, you know, the, the Christian, the, the Christian sex, the Muslim sex, or I can talk about having hot and heavy sex, right, so the first time I said that I made the sounds sex, right, sex, sex, <laughs> S-E-T-S, right, you know, I was talking about, you know, different divisions of something, right? But that exact same sound has a completely different meaning when I talk about hot and heavy sex, right? Or having sex or enjoying sex, right? Um, that schema of understanding, you know, talking about religion versus, you know, getting it on um, is going to influence how you hear and interpret words. Uh, we do that constantly, constantly. Uh, that's one of the reasons it's so hard sometimes for... Um, uh, you know, people that are hard of hearing, um, to understand people that are speaking with a thick accent or people that are speaking other languages that they don't understand very well, uh, because they have a hard time with the context. And then if they have a hard time with the context, they can have a hard time understanding what's going on. Um, so we do, you know, we do a lot of, um, you know, we do a lot of uh, uh, thinking through our intuition, uh, like emotional reactions, for example. Um, you know, emotional reactions are quick. That's the thing about them. They're really quick, right? I mean, if, if uh, you know, if um, I'm trying to think of an example that's not disgusting and, and, and perverted. Uh, <laughs> uh, um Let's see. Uh, now, I already talked about dick pics, didn't I? I can't do that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did, did I talk about was it this, was it this class that I mentioned dick pics? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Um, well, you know, let's talk about dick pics. Okay, so let's <laughs> let's say you got a dick pic, right? <laughs> And it was from somebody you didn't know very well, or maybe even somebody you didn't like, right? Uh, what is your first reaction going to be to that uh, lo that lovely image of that lovely member uh, standing before you, right? You're, you're, you're probably it's whatever reaction you're going to have, it's going to be pretty quick, right? Most ho I'm hoping that most of you young ladies would be disgusted by. <laughs> pretty sure you would be right uh, unless it's somebody you like and you're into then you might go oh, okay well that's not this is good to know i'm going to put this in you know, i'm going to file this one away and you know, make, make use of that later right um but it, whatever your emotional reaction is whether it's one of arousal or disgust or you know whatever right uh it's it's quick it happens immediately i mean our our emotional responses are uh, happen pretty low down in our in, in the center of our brains, in the amygdala and the thalamus, and you know, all these things. It, these are things that we don't control. Uh, how many of you have ever been in a situation where 
maybe a year at work and something happens at work where you get really humiliated and you want to start crying and you're trying not to cry, right? You're trying to be professional, but you're, you're like, you feel like you feel like you want to cry, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been in that situation. I actually have been in that situation. <laughs> Thank God I didn't cry, but I wanted to <laughs> like a baby, like a three-year-old, but, um, um, you know, that's because that, that crying is an emotional threat response. I mean, it's just an emotional response and you're trying to take it over with your, you know, cognitive ability. That's hard to do. It's very hard to do. Um, expertise expertise is something that's related to this topic right because one of the things about experts in anything experts in you know whatever right is they is that they do what they do almost unconsciously they do what they do almost unconsciously um so you know if you have like a uh you know a golf a, a professional golfer for example or any professional athlete any professional athlete whether it's golf baseball basketball uh, american football whatever it is you know most of what they do out there is you know honed through hours and hours and hours and hours of practice right i mean how many of you have played sports do we have any sport people who play? What did you play, Victoria? What sport did you play? Um, I played a lot growing up. Um, I I mainly played um, volleyball. That okay, was volleyball. Like yeah, that's a great example. Volleyball. Uh, I don't know if any of you ladies have played softball. Softball. softball? Yeah, softball. Yeah, softball. Who said that? Stephanie. I'm driving. Oh, there you are, Steph. Okay, yeah, yeah. Softball, <laughs> yep. Yeah, softball is a game that requires a lot of skill. And so what do you do, you know, when you're doing practice for volleyball or softball or wrestling? What is it that you do during practice, right? Drills, right? You do drills, right? You're like, you know, if you're, if you're a softball player, you know, they hit the ball to you a thousand times. You catch it a thousand times. You throw it to second base a thousand times. And they want you to do that so that eventually – or, or you know, basketball, right? What are you doing? Layups, a thousand layups, a thousand passes, you know, and they're doing that so that you can be automatic. They want that, they want that ability to go from the conscious thinking part to the automatic part. It's almost like they're conditioning you. To exactly. That. Conditioning you, breaking you down so that you're just a machine that's out there. Right. Uh, you know, one of the old sayings that people used to say when somebody, when, when an athlete was really on fire is they say, Oh man, he's unconscious. He's out there and he's unconscious. Right. I always thought that was a funny saying, right. But it's actually kind of true, right. They're not thinking they're just out there just, you know, reacting and, and doing what they do. Right. Um, but if you have any, any expert in anything, uh, whether it's sports or, um, you know, chess, chess is another example. I play chess. I love playing chess. Uh, I play it a lot. Um, and you know, professional chess players, like they can just look at a board and memorize it and they know exactly, you know, what's going on and they make moves so fast because they've seen everything. Um, you know, expert mechanics. I don't know if, if you, if you, if you've ever known a really good mechanic, who just knows, you know, cars inside and out that they are amazing, right? Uh, they're just a, they're able to kind of like just, you know, sniff around and drive the car and figure out and then they just know what's wrong with it. And that's just through years and years of expertise. But a lot of that expertise is buried underneath, right? It's, it's kind of uh, uh, not accessible to them anymore, because they've done it so many times. And that turns out that's a problem because, um, you know, one of the things that's happening in this country right now is this, uh, uh, you know, rejection of expertise, right? I mean, you guys know who Dr. Fauci is? The, 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 uh, he's the, the, the head of infectious diseases for, uh, you know, for the United, you know, for the, for the CDC or National Institutes of Health, I think. 
And, uh, you know, this guy's been studying infect infectious diseases for like 40 years. <laughs> he's advised the six presidents. I mean, he knows his shit. He's like, a, he's a world renowned expert in infectious diseases. But what do we have like 40% of the people in this country doing? They're like shitting all over him, right? Because they, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, he's just, uh, he's just trying to fuck over Trump, you know, and all this other bullshit, right? And it's like, it's ridiculous, right? It's absolutely ridiculous. But And the problem is that it's really hard. And, and the reason that's related to what we're talking about is because Dr. Fauci's expertise is honed, again, through years of experience. And he's buried, you know, he's got all of that experience. And it's really hard, you know, sometimes to share that experience. I mean, he could, right? But, you know, if you've got like a 30-second interview on TV, he's not going to like... <laughs> He's not going to start with a theory of evolution, <laughs> you know, work his way up to how viruses, you know, affect, uh, you know, affect humans, right? That's a, that's a, that's a very long chain of things you have to understand in order to understand how viruses work. And, you know, he does his best, you know, when he was, when he was allowed to be on TV, uh, he did his best, but, um, you know, eventually because of stupidity, he's kind of been pushed aside. Um, but, you know, that's unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Now, one of the take home lessons of this, all of this so far is that, you know, intuition is not bad. It's actually not bad. Uh, we rely on it a lot. Uh, I personally believe that, you know, we need to listen to our intuition quite a bit. I, really wish that, you know, there's many times in my life, I wish I would have listened to my intuition. You know, <laughs> first couple of times I was at the wedding altar for one, right? But, um, you know, I really wish I would have listened to my intuition. There's a lot of times I wish, and, and I always tell people, one of my pieces of advice I always give students or anybody who listen is, you know, listen to your gut. Listen to what your intuition says. If your intuition says that you're in a bad situation or you're in you're dealing with some seedy people or whatever, just listen to your gut and go with it. However, however, uh, intuition does have um, limits. Um, you know, it's, it can be affected by things like priming. Your intuition can be affected by things like priming. As a matter of fact, it's really easy for people to manipulate your intuition through priming. That's exactly what Donald Trump does. That's precisely what he does. He, and he does it like nobody else has ever been able to do it. Um, we make errors in judgment. Uh, we, can mis we, we can misinterpret things. We can mix fantasy with reality. Um, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong, right? Uh, so intuition does have its limits. And that's one of the reasons you have to be so careful about what you listen to, what you believe. It's, it's really, really, really hard. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's very hard to sort of like tease out the, the uh, um, fact from reality, right? Well, how would you do that? You know, how, how, how would you do, let, you know, let's, let's say, you know, let's say, um, you know, let's say your intuition was telling you that uh, somebody was right, you know, that whatever, whether it's a politician or a friend or whatever, uh, they, and they give you some fact, they make some statement, and your gut says, yeah, yeah, you know, right on, you know, well, is that enough to believe that that statement is true? Let me ask you that first. Is that enough to believe that statement is true? I hope you say no. Okay. <laughs> say no. Okay. <laughs> cause it's, cause it's not right. Well, how would you, con how would you validate that statement? What would you do? Do you guys know what you would do? What would you, I mean, you know, you do it with your professors, right? I mean, what, what if I told you that, uh, you know, what if I said something like, uh, uh, the average IQ of, uh, of Mexicans is 25 points lower than white, than white people's IQs. First of all, it's not true. Second of all, I'm Mexican, but <laughs> just go with me here. Right. <laughs> but what if, you know, what if I'm lecturing to you and I'm, you know, I'm a you know, professor, right. You're supposed to like, sort of like trust what I say, right. Which I, I always encourage you to 
not trust what I say. Always, always check me, right? But um, what if I said that as part of my lecture? I said, you know, well, you know, one of the things about being Mexican is that our IQs are 25 points lower than white people's. What would you do? How would you confirm that or deny? How, how, what would you do? Tell me what you would do. You'd have to have oh results God. or tests that were done in order to prove that fact okay, instead okay. of it just being said. Okay, so where would you go to find such information like results or tests? Where would you go? I guess on different studies that have been done. Okay, Scholarly so academic places. You'd okay. have to go to like the National Institute of like Health or like just somewhere somewhere reputable that has done stuff okay. like there, there are databases yeah, okay. that available to us as students okay. too. So, so let's say, let's say you did that, right? Let's say you went and found a, uh, a paper or, you know, maybe even an article online, right? That was written by uh, somebody who does research in intelligence, right? And you say you found that and you're like, you print it out or, you know, take a screenshot and, you know, show it to show it to your your stupid ass professor here, right? And and all I have to say is bullshit. That's not true. Here's my references, and I whip out a couple of, of websites, right? Here's my references right here, and I show you my websites. How do you know who is right and who is wrong? What what do you do then? Well, right now I'm learning in writing in psychology, my writing in psychology class, that you always need to like check the websites that you're at. Um, for example, if the websites that you're at are like, um, you know, something called, I, I guess BuzzFeed. If you're yeah. on BuzzFeed and you've got this pop psych article saying yeah. that, yeah. Um, and there's ads everywhere, no references, or it, the references are other pop psych or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Random places. Yeah, essentially, essentially what we're getting at here is, you know, verification, right? Making sure that you check the source, right? See, is the source reputable? In other words, do other experts in this area trust the <laughs> source, right? Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And here's the, here's the take home lesson. Truth is a social activity. Like it or not, truth in, in, in our day to day world, in this world, truth is a social activity, right? If I hear something that I don't believe or want to verify, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and seek out reputable other sources to verify that claim, right? So if, you know, if, some, if Reagan comes to me with her, you know, her NIH, you know, sponsored article, right? Well, if, if she had more time, she could come to me with 10, 20, 30 articles, right? All from experts that, if, in other words, from people that have studied that phenomenon. You know, me, I would be going to InfoWars and, and you know, <laughs> and your Rush Limbaugh's site and, you know, whatever else, right, to, to find what I want to support my claim, right? Um, but, the, and, and again, even that's difficult today, right? Because so many people are confused by what constitutes an expert versus a non-expert. And there's people that have rejected expertise outright, in other words, I'm not going to trust the experts. I'm going to trust my own judgment, which is like insanely stupid in a lot of cases, right? I mean, if you're dealing with life and death and diseases and chemicals. Literally and, was having an yeah. argument with a person exactly like that yeah. yesterday. And, and, you know, I really don't know what to do in those situations. I really don't. I, I've given up. You um, sort of have to leave it alone. Yeah. yeah That's what I'm doing. Because she, it's, it's not like... She's not going to be swayed by anything I say if she's not going to be swayed by anything experts say. Exactly. Like exactly. my dad was like, it could come from the mouth of God Himself, exactly. and he wouldn't listen to her. That's right. Like that's, she wouldn't listen to him. That's exactly right, and and that, and a lot of people are like that. As a matter of fact, that leads us into our next topic: overconfidence. <laughs> <laughs> this is another fundamental thing that we see in social psychology, right? The overconfidence phenomenon is exactly what you think it is. It's exactly what you think it is. And that is the tendency to be more confident than correct. <laughs> okay. More confident than correct. To overestimate the accuracy of your beliefs. That's exactly what it is, right? You know, why, you know, 
why do we have overconfidence? Well, you know, again, it's a overconfidence fundamentally is a mm. great way to support your own beliefs. It is a fantastic way to support your own beliefs. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not. Right? Sometimes it's not. A lot of times it's not actually. You know, I, I like to think that I'm overconfident in my belief that my kids love me. Uh, I like to think I like to think that I'm overconfident in my belief that uh, Jesus died for my sins uh, and that Jesus loves me. I like to think that I'm overconfident in my beliefs that my wife loves me. Uh, you know, that's cool, right? But I'm not going to be overconfident in my belief that uh, that Dr. Fauci and Bill Gates are conspiring to put us all under. <laughs> the one world rule, right? Or whatever it is that they believe, you know, that's, that's something else. Um, one of the, uh, one of the aspects of, of overconfidence has been studied in fairly recently in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, studied by David Dunning and Justin Kruger, David Dunning and Justin Kruger. And this is known as the Dunning Kruger effect, the Dunning Kruger effect. Okay. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is one of those things that helps to explain a lot of dealing with these people that have like these insane beliefs, right? Basically, the Dunning-Kruger effect is this, okay? People that are um, incompetent or unknowledgeable about a particular area are so unknowledgeable about that area that they don't know that they're wrong. But they have this high confidence in their beliefs, right? But they have zero knowledge about it. So they don't, they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And they don't know that they're wrong. Okay. So take the example of the, you know, the, uh, the COVID-19 divide, uh, 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 deniers, Right, these people that deny that there really is a COVID nineteen pandemic going on. Right, um, these people are supremely confident in their beliefs. Right, supremely confident. Um, but you know, how much do they know about infectious diseases? How much do they know about disease epidemiology? How much do they know about you know the basics of evolution, the evolution of viruses? How much do they know about? Um, uh, the treatment of viruses, the medical, the, me, the, 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 the pharmacology of the treatment of viruses, right? They don't know, or the history, you know, how much do they know about history? You know, all you have to do is look at the Spanish flu of the uh, epidemic of 1912. We're going through exactly the same thing right now, right? And there were idiots back then who weren't wearing masks too, just like today. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, that's a lot of knowledge that you have to have to understand what's going on. And if you're willing to accept the word of experts, you don't have to spend your whole life getting a PhD in infectious diseases, right? You just say, okay, this guy, he has a PhD in infectious diseases. He knows what the fuck he's talking about. I'm going to listen to this guy. Right. Um, but if, with the Dunning Kruger effect, right. You don't know that understanding infectious diseases is a very complicated thing. You're just like, oh, well, you know, it's just like the common cold. And they're just making it up because they want to. Yeah, up. BuzzFeed told me that, you know, uh, wearing a mask might give me like lung cancer. Yeah, so. exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's it, those are the types of type, type. Yeah, and it's like, and if you don't know anything about, you know, the basics of, 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 of human anatomy and physiology, if, I mean, this is stuff that's taught in the third grade to good students, right? You're not gonna, you're not gonna, you're gonna believe shit like that. But the Dunning-Kruger effect underlies a lot of these like, uh, strange beliefs uh, that people have. Uh, like, did you know that there's a bunch of flat earthers? That people that believe that the earth mm -hmm. is flat? I'm not kidding. There's people that believe that. They're that, crazy. <laughs> that, yeah, that the earth is flat. And, you know, I'm like, what the fuck? You, how the hell? You, how did you, do you, can you dress yourself every day? What the fuck <laughs> is going on? You know, I just, it just blows, as, a, as somebody who teaches science, I just like, my, you know, faith in humanity destroyed, right, basically. But, you know, you, you've got the COVID-19 deniers. You've got the, the flat earthers. You, oh, the global warming deniers. There's another group of people, 
right? The global warming, you know, global warming is going to kill us all in about 200 years. And people are like, ah, it's just a, you know, it's another democratic plot to make Donald Trump look bad, or it's just the liberals trying to take over the world or whatever the fuck they say it is, right? It's like, no, if you understand the physics of carbon and the chemistry of carbon and understand how much carbon we've pumped into the air over the last uh, 400 years, it's, it makes a lot of sense, you know, but again, you know, these people don't have the basic fundamental knowledge that they, that they need to, to, to be able to understand that, oh, you know what, I don't know enough, I don't understand this, okay, um, I like to tell people that, um, honestly, uh, when I got my PhD, uh, I got my PhD in 1993, uh, I was 28 years old, you know, I was a 28 year old dumb shit. And I, at that point in my life, I felt like I was the stupidest human being in the world. I really, I like, I didn't know shit. And I think the reason I felt that way is because, you know, having gone through graduate school, I, I understood how much I didn't know, right? I knew what I didn't know. I knew that I didn't know shit. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I didn't know anything. Yes, I had a lot of knowledge, you know, that I gained in school and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But man, I tell you, I, I for some reason, I just felt completely like lost because I just, I felt like I didn't know anything, but you know, plus it was, I guess it's being 28 years old, <laughs> right? But uh, um one of the uh, one of the things that's related to um, our, dis our our thinking processes. Uh, remember, I said that you know our thinking uh, is uh, a social activity, right? Truth is a social activity. Well, one of the things that that shows us, and it's related to um, overconfidence, is something called a confirmation bias. A confirmation bias. And this is one of a long list of what we call cognitive biases. In other words, in other words, we have, you know, right, we have the capability of thinking logically about every scientifically and logically about everything, right? We could if we wanted to, but we don't, right? First, first of all, it's hard. It's really hard to be scientific and logical about everything, right? Like, I'm not going to be scientific and logical about how cute my cat is, right? I mean, if my cat's laying there on his belly, you know, and wanting me to rub his belly, uh, yeah, I could be all scientific about it and talk about the evolutionary uh, relationships. Uh, he has seen me as an alpha male and therefore uh, he is submitting himself because of the behaviors of, of submission and the rank order and the hierarchy of the social structure that cats live in because of the evolutionary history of, of alpha predators. And, you know, I could go into all that shit, right? But no, I'm just going to go, oh, look at my little baby kitty and I'm going to rub his tummy and he's going to purr, and, right? It's just, you know, that's, that's, it's easier to do that, right? Well, another thing that's easier to do is this confirmation bias. And what we do with what the confirmation bias is, is this. It's the tendency to seek out information that supports our beliefs. The tendency to seek out well, information that supports our beliefs. I have a really good example for this. And it was happening. It's literally happening now. And I'm sure some of you have seen it where on Facebook, this thing is getting spread around where it's like the, the COVID-19 deniers are using it to say, oh, only 6% of people di that died from COVID died only from COVID. And they're ignoring, like, that's what they're focusing on rather exactly. than the 94% that had underlying conditions, which is not new information. Exactly, exactly. They are presenting things in such a way that confirms what they believe. Um, Fox News, the Fox News channel, it's all, it is entirely about confirmation bias. That's what it is. It presents things that make, you know, I, I had a student tell me one time, you know, who was, she was a big Fox News fan and, you know, she was telling me, well, you know, I just want to see news that, that, that I like, that, that makes me feel better uh, about, and I said, that's exactly what the confirmation bias is. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you're looking for things that, um, 
you know, that, that, that support your beliefs. And unfortunately, we, all of us do that a lot, all, me included. We all do that a lot. It's one of those things you need to look out for, right? Um, I, always, I always say that if, if you, know, you want to really understand the other position, right, the other position, whatever that is, uh, get to the point where you can defend it. Get to the point where you can defend it, okay? Uh, so that, you know, if you can defend the other side, that means you have a complete understanding of that other side, right? And, you, and you've sort of helped to eliminate the confirmation bias, right? Because you're in, in, in learning about the other position, you know, you had to seek out information that was going against your beliefs, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it's a, it's a great way to, it's a great way to overcome that, right? Um, the you know, over confidence is a good thing, right? Um, but one of the things you want, one of the lessons that we take from this is you want to be careful when people make these broad dogmatic statements, you know, just whenever, whenever somebody does that, you know, makes like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, whenever Donald Trump says, uh, you know, all immigrants are criminals, right? Most of his, most of his followers believe that, or, you know, whenever, um, uh, I mean, there's tons of examples of when making these big, broad statements, um, you know, be, be wary of that. That's usually those big, broad statements are usually indicative of, of uh, uh, a little bit of, of, of uh, overconfidence, right? One of the things that fights overconfidence um, is uh, immediate feedback, immediate feedback. And I've done this, right? Um, you know, whenever I've had arguments with, you know, people that are like really ultra conservative and, and whatnot, you know, they'll say something, right? And usually, you know, just because I like to read and whatnot, I'll be able to come back and say, well, you know, it's not quite true because of this. And, you know, usually, th th eventually, that just gets them to shut up. Or they'll just say, okay, well, fuck you. Right? <laughs> they'll just stop, they'll just stop engaging with you, right? But, um, but it, for that moment, at least for that moment, at least you've kind of like shut them down a little bit and hopefully make them think. Right. And, you know, I'm not, you know, knocking on, you know, uh, I don't want to be knocking on conservatives. Although I'm, I'm, I'm conservative in a lot of my beliefs, but, um, but, uh, you know, I'm talking about these people that have that this, just this worldview of only one way the world should be, right? Only one way the world should be. Yeah, most of the time, like, the I've learned that uh, the correct stance is not usually the one that is presented by either side. It's usually it's somewhere the, the in, the middle, is in the middle or a mix. Yeah, yeah, the truth it's is messy. in the middle. It's messy. It's not yeah. black and white. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's the way life is, as a matter of fact. It, you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Aristotle, said this i mean he said there was the the thesis the antithesis so the two sides and then the 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 thing in the middle was the synthesis the synthesis or synthesis right putting them together and the truth is in the middle somewhere right it's that's that's always the case right um let's see okay so let's see i think we're out of time so i think oh i did pretty good not bad Okay, so next time we're going to pick, we're going to keep going with uh, mental shortcuts. We're going to be talking about what are called heuristics, which are little shortcuts that we use in making decisions. Uh, sometimes those heuristics are awesome, especially if you're an expert, and other times they bite you in the ass. So <laughs> we're, gonna, we're going to be talking about those next time. But uh, anyway, so you guys have a good uh, Thursday. Have a good evening. There's a, there's, a, there's a Bud Light downstairs with my name on it, so I'm going to go have that right now. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have a good evening and I will see you uh uh Friday. Friday. See you Friday. All right. Bye. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.